I've been looking forward to my conversation with today's guest for some time. Keith, it's good to have you on the show. Tell me when you first arrived in Australia. So I came to Australia temporarily in 1973 to do what was my first PhD. Uh -huh. So I was still on unpaid leave from the War Office. I just completed my first degree in England and came here to do a, my first, what became my first PhD, which was on the international law of warfare, intending to go back to England. But in fact, I just decided to stay on. So what about your link at Wesley Mission? How did that happen? So um, in 19... Um, I've just got to get the years right. 1976, um, I was finishing the, the PhD. Um, I couldn't go back to the United Kingdom until it had been examined. And so I had to find temporary employment. Mm. And I was at a Christian conference and somebody said, oh, well, Alan Walker, at what was then the Central Methodist Mission, was looking for a director of administration. Mm. Why didn't you go to work there for a few years, yeah. get the PhD sorted out, then you can return to England. Mm. And then I've just stayed on. I've stayed on connected with the mission all the way through from mm. 1976 onwards. And it's been very much a part of your life, really, hasn't it? Very much so. And indeed, uh, my third PhD, which I've recently completed... Well, there's no need to brag, you know. <laughs> my third PhD is looking at the future of the Uniting Church yes. and how it could evolve. And a lot of that is drawn from my experience at being at the mission. Indeed, one of the scenarios that I talk about the future of the Uniting Church is actually called Word and Deed, which yeah. is, of course, yeah. the way in our business model at Wesley Mission. And do you think we've got it right? I think that it's what it, with scenario planning, there are basically three ways of thinking about the future. One is prediction, like, uh, you know, who's going to win, I don't know, the Melbourne Cup or who's going to win the presidential election. Most predictions don't work. But one has certainly continued to work, which is relating to the power of, or growing power of computers. So that's one way of thinking about the future, making predictions. The second way is having a vision, a preferred way that you then work towards. So you build a bridge back from the future, uh, from the past, from the future to the present, like putting a man on the moon. President Kennedy's 1962 pledge, and so they had to work out how they're going to do that. That's the vision, and you work backwards. Third way of thinking about the future is what could happen, not what is being currently predicted, not what uh, you'd necessarily like to see happen, but what could happen. Mm. You know, we've just gone through this coronavirus crisis, for mm. example, mm -hmm. and no one had seen that coming, and we should have been having contingency plans to make sure that we had appropriate health care, etc. Now, I've used that technique which is called scenario planning, mm -hmm. for thinking about what could happen with the future of the Nighting Church. I'm not making predictions. I'm not saying what I would like to see, but what are the four possibilities that mm -hmm. could emerge? Mm -hmm. And one of them would be word and deed. Mm -hmm. In other words, that we consolidate churches, mm -hmm. link them in social welfare, mm -hmm. and create a network, really, of uh, parallel Wesley missions. And that letter that came earlier in the programme that I was sharing is mm -hmm. that people often wonder, why, why don't we just give up that and, and just get on with uh, the community work? Well, well, I've got a second scenario on that, which is that we allow the congregation congregations just to die off and concentrate on that community work. Because if you look at the Uniting Church, a lot of people say the Uniting Church is declining. That's not true. If the, if the Uniting Church had a consolidated set of accounts, it would be one of the largest corporations in Australia because all the real estate, the aged care, the child care, yeah. etc. But the real growth area in terms of money is actually in welfare, yeah. not the congregations. So a second scenario that I've done would be that of having Uniting Church just focusing on community welfare, as we've seen other Christian agencies going mm. down that mm. path. Mm. A third scenario is that you could end up with parishes rejecting all this focus on community welfare, government bureaucracy and all the rest of red tape and just returning to the early church. Mm. And a fourth scenario is that um, the Uniting Church decides to wind itself up and you have the different pieces going in their own separate ways. Obviously, something like Wesley Mission could continue to operate on its own. Uh, the community welfare sector could also operate in mm. its own way. So you'd actually see the, the dissolution of the Uniting Church and its reinvention mm. in other contexts. You've worked with three superintendents, really, over that... And that's a lot of years. None, <laughs> none of us stay ten minutes, do we? Uh, uh, what, what's your reflection on that when you look? Because they're all three very different characters. Three very different characters, but all appropriate for the time. Yeah. So if you take someone like Alan Walker, I learned to write media releases working with Alan Walker. 
Walker. Mm. You know, he showed me how you write the media release, which at that time worked well because we had a print media mm. Mm -hmm. world in mm -hmm. those days. Uh, Gordon Moyes was very much... Although Alan Walker did TV, Gordon did a lot more of radio and TV, and you've obviously maintained that tradition and moved us across into the internet era yeah. with websites as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've been very blessed that we've had, uh, in my time, three superintendents who are obviously able to make the most of the opportunities for spreading the good news and also developing the welfare work for the mission. And do you believe that the, the need for strong leadership is, is certainly something we still have to desire in the church? Absolutely. You need to have uh, one focal point, somebody at the top there who can make good decisions. Uh, the problem with the Uniting Church is that we come out of a, a mindset which says, well, we don't trust anybody to make any decisions. Mm. And so a lot of the rest of the Uniting Church is often just bogged down in a swamp because no one is willing to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a, with a parish where they had a minister who went off the rails. The Uniting Church reaction is, well, we've got to set up a committee to look at this. Mm. Whereas in the Anglican tradition, you send in somebody who's got complete power to sort something out. One person who can make the decision. Keith, Always talking to you is interesting. We always get tons and tons of material in such a short time. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the privilege of talking to you, reflecting. I'm not sure everybody in the United Church will have enjoyed it as much as, <laughs> as, much as we have in our conversation. But you're realistic about what you, you believe and, and do, and it's a joy to work with you.